Good evening. My name is Kim and welcome to this Tuesday evening Master Gardeners program presentation on three selective invasive insects. Welcome back to those of you who attended last night's presentation on noxious weeds. Again, before getting started, just a few housekeeping items. The microphones have been muted and the participant videos are off so that we can focus on the presenters. The chat box is visible to moderators for questions and questions will be periodically relayed to the presenter. If you don't see the chat box, look for the more tab or the three dots tab on your Zoom panel. We will be recording tonight's presentation and posting it on our Master Gardener website. At the conclusion of this evening's workshop, seven short evaluation questions will be posted on the screen. Your responses provide important feedback to us and the evaluation is a requirement of our funder. Thank you in advance for taking a minute to respond. Note that the survey questions will be in pairs, asking you to rate your knowledge of certain <coughs> topics before and after today's talk. So thank you for your interest in the early detection of invasive species. Again, we hope you learn, enjoy learning some really fascinating information about our natural world and that you will be able to participate further as citizen scientists. Next slide, please. This evening's workshop is brought to you by the Master Gardener Program of WSU Extension Clark County and the Green Neighbors, sponsored by Clark County Public Health Solid Waste Outreach. We have partnered with the Clark County Public Works Vegetation Management for Monday's evening's noxious weed presentation and with the USDA, US Department of Agriculture for this evening's invasive insect presentation. Next slide, please. Again, your hosts for this evening's workshop are Erica Johnson, WSU Extension Master Gardener Program Coordinator, and Master Gardeners Carol Wiseman and myself, Kim Grabiel. Turning this over to Carol at this point. Carol, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm talking away. <laughs> okay, I'm Carol. Um, I'm one of the master gardeners supporting this program. This intro will be followed by a training session tonight provided by Yolanda in Guanzo from the USDA. Yolanda will be presenting a session on invasive insects. As we shared last night, we're looking for participants to help spread awareness and help with early detection of invasive weeds and insects. Yolanda's training will help you identify the invasive insects we are targeting and distinguish them from common lookalikes. We hope you'll report your findings and make a difference in controlling invasives in Washington State. Tonight's agenda will take us through a brief overview of invasives, what they are and what weeds and insects are we targeting. Yolanda's training session will follow this brief introduction. After Yolanda's presentation, we will provide a short tutorial of the reporting tool and provide links for additional resources. As we learned last night, invasive species are any species that spread rapidly, displace natives and cause great harm to the environment, the economy or people. Justin Collel provided examples of these with his talk on garlic mustard and its ability to take over an understory and the toxic nature of both poison hemlock and tansy ragwort. Erica will now provide a brief review of the three weeds and an introduction to the three insects that we are targeting. These six species were chosen in consultation with our experts as species that a citizen scientist could readily identify and provide valuable information to support control and or eradication efforts. Take it away, Eric. Ah, Thanks, Carol. As with the invasive weeds that we covered in last night's talk, invasive insects lack of natural enemies and rapid spread allows them to outcompete native wildlife in natural areas, destroy crops on our farms and wreak havoc in our home gardens and urban landscapes. The financial costs of, bot of battling invasive species are staggering, but eradication via the use of pesticides also comes at a high cost in terms of its impacts on water quality. And next slide. 
you'll see reference to both the common and Latin names for the weed and insect species that are the focus of this series. Common names are easier to spell and pronounce, but their use can result in confusion if not accompanied by the scientific or Latin name. Please be sure to cross-reference the scientific name with the common name when you're doing your research. Next slide. Last night's presentation included training on how to recognize poison hemlock, tansy ragwort, and garlic mustard, all three of which are currently found in Clark County. For those who were not in attendance last night or those who'd like to see it again, a recording of that presentation should be up on our website in the next day or two. And next slide. Tonight's training features three invasive insects that have not yet been found in the, in the Northwest. Unfortunately, their eventual arrival is expected, and when it comes, they could have a truly devastating effect on our community. The emerald ash borer beetle was discovered in Michigan in 2002, and its range now includes 35 states coming as far west as Colorado. It probably arrived in the United States on solid wood packing material carried in cargo ships or airplanes from Asia. And the cost of potential emerald ash borer damage in U.S. communities during the 10 year period of 2009 to 19 for treatment, removal and replacement of new trees was calculated at $10.7 billion. The emerald ash borer beetle is a small iridescent green beetle and you'll develop some familiarity with how to recognize this beetle, but more likely detecting its presence will come from seeing the distinct D-shaped exit holes made by the larvae when they exit the tree. And you'll also learn that ash trees are its preferred host plant. The Asian longhorn beetle uh, was discovered in Chicago, Illinois in 1998, and it's now found in six Eastern states. It's believed to have been introduced to the United States on wood pallets and wood packing material in cargo shipments from Asia. And as of a 2008 report, total state and federal cost for the Asian longhorn beetle eradication program, including research and development was about $373 million for, you, for the United States. You'll learn to recognize it as well, but as with the uh, emerald ash borer beetle, signs of the Asian longhorn beetle's presence on tree bark will be easier to spot. The holes that their young make when exiting the tree holes are round. They aren't as picky as the emerald ash borer beetle and have a wide variety of feeding hosts, mostly hardwood trees. And lastly, the spotted lanternfly. This was first identified in just 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania where it's believed to have arrived on shipments of stone from China. Um, uh, two dead specimens have been discovered in Oregon just last October. One came in a shipment of planters and ceramic pots and another in a box of boxes, but no living specimens have been found to date, luckily. A recent report determined that in the quarantine zone in Pennsylvania, Damage from spotted lanternfly is currently estimated to be at $50 million per year with a loss of 484 jobs. Despite its name, spotted lanternfly is not a fly. It's a plant hopper in the order Hemiptera, which also includes true bugs, aphids, and cicadas. The spotted lanternfly itself is very distinctive looking with its gray and blue cover, uh, coloring and black spots. But not only might one see an adult, like the one here, you'll also learn to recognize the egg mass that they deposit on tree bark. Spotted lanternfly is known for its affinity for tree of heaven and grapes. And with that, I'd like to ask Carol to stop sharing her presentation and we will turn it over to Yolanda. Yolanda Nguanzo is a pest survey specialist with the US Department of Agriculture. Thanks for joining us, Yolanda. Thank you. Um, how does that look? Does that look okay? The way it I'm does. Sharing? Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much to the Master Gardeners for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all. Um, I, um, as they said, I'm gonna talk about these three insect pests, the emerald ash borer, the spotted lanternfly, and the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, these are all exotic species that can have um, a very bad impact. Um, I need to figure out how to move this out of the way. There we go. Um, 
exotic invasive species can displace native species by feeding on them or by outcompeting them and feeding on um, in the same niches. Um, they can reduce or degrade uh, native wildlife habitat. They can delay the regeneration of trees, degrade water quality, um, cause more pesticide to be applied to the landscape, increase costs to government agencies, impact the recreation value of lands, um, restrict export markets as other countries put quarantines on our products, um, increase um, fuel loading and fire hazards as trees um, decline and die in, in forests and increase the production costs of agricultural crops. I'm gonna start with the spotted lantern fly, like Horma delicatula. It's in the order Hemiptera, family Fulgoridae, um, and these insects are commonly known as plant hoppers. And um, it's kind of useful to know that it's in this family because um, the insects in this family feed on uh, plants with a straw-like mouth part, which they insert into plant tissues. Um, going over its life cycle, starting with the eggs. There's usually one generation per year and they overwinter in the egg stage. And the eggs are deposited on vertical surfaces. So they're kind of adapted to look for vertical surfaces um, so usually tree trunks, but also sheds and trailers and vehicles. And in this way, sometimes they can increase their range by, um, by being moved um, on, on uh, vehicles or, or trailers. Um, the eggs are covered in this kind of waxy, um, yellowish brown material. In this slide, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough, but the eggs are kind of poking out from the top there. And then there's a covering over them that it kind of looks like chewing gum a little bit and they blend in really well with the tree trunks. Um, and the eggs hatch in mid-May, depending on, on the temperature. If it's hotter, they'll hatch sooner. Here's some more pictures of, of some egg masses on tree trunks. Here there's an egg mass on the left and on the right, an egg mass that has hatched and an old egg mass that's been exposed to the weather for, for maybe a year. Because the egg masses are stationary, they stay put, it might be the life stage that you'll be able to find when you're out looking and out surveying. Um, you might not ever find an actual insect because they kind of move around in there, you know, and they can hide, but the egg mass might be the easiest thing for you to look for as you're out surveying. So after the eggs hatch, they, um, they undergo an incomplete metamorphosis, um, the first through third instars. And instars are the life stages um, in between each molt. So they molt their exoskeleton. Um, and the first through third of those moltings, the, the larvae will be, or the immature insects will be black with white dots. And then in the fourth instar, the fourth molting, um, they become red with black and white spots. <clears throat> Here's another kind of close up picture of, of the fourth in star. And then um, the adult stage is this kind of dusky pink color. Here's another picture that kind of shows you all the immature stages side by side. And the adult. This is not how you would see it because this one has been pinned and um, the wings artificially spread, but it kind of allows you to see that the front wings are this dusty pink color and the hind wings have um, a very bright red color. So you'll see the flash of red when they're in flight. Um, here's a picture of the massing in um, a grape plant. Um, grape is one of their favorite hosts. And here's kind of a picture of their life cycle superimposed over the seasons of the year. So um, they lay their eggs in late fall and then the eggs overwinter. So they'll go through the winter in the egg stage. So um, this is even something you could be looking for when you're out snowshoeing or, or um, cross country skiing, you could be looking for egg masses. 
Um, in the spring, they'll hatch and they'll go through that, those first three molts where they're black with white dots. And then in um, late summer to early fall, they'll go through the stage where they're red and then the adult stage late summer through December. Um, also, some things that you might see, even if you don't see any of the actual insects, you might see signs of their feeding. So when they feed on plants, um, the, the feeding by that um, straw-like mouth part causes so much of the sap to go through their body that it comes out the other end in the form of honeydew. And there might be a lot of honeydew deposited on the plants that they're feeding on. And um, sooty mold uh, will grow on the honeydew. So if you see um, this kind of thing, sooty mold growing on a plant with honeydew, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's spotted lanternfly. It could be any insect that feeds in the same way with a straw-like mouth part, but it's just something to, to pay close attention to if you see um, this uh, sign of feeding on the host plants that spotted lanternfly um, prefer. Just keep an eye on those plants and see if you find more clues. Here's some more pictures of, of sooty molds coating the leaves of a, of a plant. They can also feed on the trunk of the trees and the sooty mold um, could be on the trunk as well. And sooty mold could be along the base of a tree. And it's always a good idea to pay attention to, to looking at the base of the tree to give you a clue as to what might be feeding on the tree up in the canopy. More pictures of the sooty mold that might be dripping down from above. So the spotted lanternfly is native to China. It also occurs in Southeast Asia and South Korea. In the US, um, and this map is, um, um, I can't see now <laughs> what it says up above, but I think it's, it's fairly current from this year. The red outline around those blue counties are um, where individual um, or are where the quarantine area has been placed. And if you can see the counties that have uh, small dots in them, that's where individual finds um, of the insect have been found. So on their own, they can fly. Um, of three to four miles, but they're more likely to be spread um, with human assistance spread. So people can spread them on their yard waste and on their gardening equipment, um, nursery stock, firewood, outdoor furniture, outdoor articles, RVs, trailers, um, bins, um, construction material and playground equipment. And um, it's good to remember that any, any place, any vertical surface where they may uh, lay their eggs is a potential article that could um, move and spread them. So their hosts, they have a, a pretty wide range of things that they feed on. Um, and a lot of these almonds, apples, apricots, um, these are, this is a list of the hosts that are uh, agricultural crops. And of course we know that apples are very important in Washington. Um, And here are uh, other hosts that are forest trees or landscape trees. Um, their favorite host is Tree of Heaven, and it's thought that they, they it's possible that they may need Tree of Heaven um, in the first in the first few instars or larval stages. Um, but they can also feed on a lot of other plants. Um, Tree of Heaven is a Class C noxious weed in Washington, and it's an exotic plant from China. And it itself is also a threat to ecosystems because of its invasive nature. Um, if you're lucky enough to be able to find some tree of heaven, um, or I don't know if lucky is the right word, but this would be the best place to do survey for this insect. Um, here where I live in, in Western Washington, there's not a lot of it. I haven't found a lot of it, but there are, um, counties to the east where it's a lot more um, commonly found. But I'm gonna go through a little bit of the characteristics of Tree of Heaven um, to help you identify it if you're if you able to find it. 
Uh, the new flush and new leaves as they're um, just expanding um, have this kind of pinkish orange color. And um, I spent enough time in the Eastern US where this is really common that when I see this picture, it automatically brings to mind the smell of rancid peanut butter because that's, um, that's what the leaves smell like. And that's a really good way to identify it. If you find a plant that you think might be tree of heaven, um, crush the leaf and smell it. And it smells like peanut butter, but really like peanut butter that's gone bad. Um, it is a compound leaf plant. So this entire um, stem here is one leaf and, the, and these are leaflets coming off of the, the midrib of the leaf. Um, the, the leaflets are not serrated. Um, there are other compound leaf plants found in Washington that have serrated leaflets. So you can distinguish it from those. And they have one large tooth at the base of the leaflet. And the fruits, you might not ever find a plant with fruits on it, but if you do, they, that's what they look like, dry, papery samaras. Here's an up close picture of a leaflet with that large tooth, and that's a very distinguishing characteristic of this plant, as well as the smell. And that's how I always can be sure that that's what it is, is just take a smell, a crumple a leaf and smell it, and it, it really is a very distinctive um, rancid peanut butter smell. Other plants that we have here that look like Tree of Heaven, um, sumac. Sumac has a serrated leaf and it doesn't have that large tooth at the base. Uh, walnut, walnut is actually very pleasant smelling, I think. Um, and it, again, it doesn't have the large tooth at the base. Elderberry has a serrated leaf with no tooth at the base, or leaflet, I should say. And um, ash, uh, true ash, which um, also doesn't have the large tooth at the base of the leaflet. Um, the distribution of Tree of Heaven, which the Latin name is Alanthus altissima, um, it's um, found in most states except for in the Northern Plains. And here in Washington, um, and I, I'll just take this opportunity to say that some of these slides, if you can't see them, um, please um, just, uh, uh, I'm happy to email the slides or, or um, any particular slides, or if you want me to email this, the whole slideshow to anyone, just send me, send me an email and I'm happy to do that. And so you can see these better. I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly, but um, in Washington, Tree of Heaven is found um, in uh, Chelan and Douglas, and then down here in Klickitat County um, in, you know, in higher quantities. And in um, where I live in Thurston County, I don't think it's found, I haven't, I've never found it in Thurston County, but um, if you are able to, you know, when you're on vacation, you're able to see Tree of Heaven in another county, um, it's a great opportunity to um, take a look and, and kind of do a survey. So U.S. populations of spotted lanternfly, it was first confirmed in September of 2014 um, in a um, business importing stone from overseas. And it's thought that um, probably uh, an adult female laid eggs on some stone. Maybe they were situated in a vertical configuration and, and, um, and the insect just, you know, landed on it and um, deposited some egg masses, which were then loaded on a container and then brought to the Eastern US. Um, the size of the reproducing population in Pennsylvania is 3,000 square miles. And there are uh, several other satellite populations that it's thought that they may have moved on, um, on rail uh, containerized uh, cargo. Um, I had an opportunity to go work on the um, Spotted Lanternfly Eradication Program in Eastern in Eastern New Jersey. And so I took a few pictures. So you can see at the time that I was there, they were at this life stage. Um, early in stars, they were black and white. And they're uh, seen here feeding on um, Tree of Heaven. Here's another picture of a early in star. Um, the program was, the plan was, um, the strategy that they were using to eradicate it was to spray the tree of heaven with a systemic insecticide, um, thinking that they would, you know, they would feed on that plant and, um, and then be killed. And there's quite a lot more tree of heaven there than there is here in Eastern Washington, where again, there's really not that much. 
We also tested out a detection, a, a, an attractant uh, trap. This is a sticky band that we put around. And this is actually, believe it or not, a tree of heaven. Um, they got to be huge there. And um, an attractant lure right here. And I'm not sure if the, if the lure was really working well or if there was just so many of these insects that they were just kind of getting blown onto the sticky material by the wind or falling onto it. So um, some, some suggestions here for surveying for uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, if you can um, find and record locations of Tree of Heaven in places where um, near where you live or where you, um, where you travel, where you hike. Um, if you're able to visit these sites, if they're close enough to you um, and visit several times through spring and fall, that would be ideal. Um, read the materials and familiarize yourself with it, the pictures, what they look like. Um, inspect the tree of heaven or grape uh, is also a good host. Um, carefully include the undersides of the leaves, the stems along the entire length of the stem because they can kind of be very cryptic and if they're, uh, if they're small and they walk behind the stem, you might not see them. So carefully examine um, the plant, including the base of the stem or the trunk. Um, if you're looking at a plant that's very tall and you can't easily see the top of the canopy, use binoculars to help you inspect the upper canopy. Um, Look for egg masses on, on vertical surfaces like tree trunks, rocks, trailers, and sheds. The best time of year to survey, again, uh, you can survey for egg masses um, in the winter while you're out snowshoeing or cross-country skiing. Um, you, can, you can survey for feeding damage any time of the year and survey for active populations should happen July to November. Um, record your observations and locations, including the latitude and longitude coordinates and the date that you made the observation. Um, if possible, take photos where you find feeding damage, and especially if you find insects that you think might be spotted lanternfly, um, and attach photos labeled with the date and lo the location where you found the photo. Um, and if you'd like me to help format and organize any data co collection methods, please um, don't hesitate to to contact me. If you actually see an insect that you think might be spotted lanternfly and you're able to um, collect it, um, put it in a jar or container and put it in the freezer and then contact me. Um, good sites to look anywhere that tree of heaven occurs, anywhere that grapes, grape vineyards or backyard grape plants, tree fruit or orchards, <clears throat> wholesale and retail, distributors of outdoor products, utility and transportation right-of-ways, construction companies and contractors, landscapers, anywhere that yard waste is collected and aggregated, um, loggers and firewood dealers, and um, margins of agricultural fields and industrial areas. So moving on to the next. Yolanda? Uh, yeah. But before you move on, there was a question in the chat box asking about what the size of the egg mass is. Um, the egg mass can be um, anywhere from about an inch to maybe two inches. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the Emerald Ash Borer. This insect is in the order Coleoptera. Um, and um, if you're like me, a lot of uh, a lot of entomologists like to put cat put the insects into categories. I like you know putting them in their box where they belong. It kind of helps you know a little bit um, you know more about them, just knowing what order or family they're in. So the order Coleoptera are all the beetles, and um, this insect belongs to the family Buprestidae, which are the metallic wood boring beetles. And the insects in this family are usually metallic. They're usually very pretty. They have a metallic um, uh, covering. Um, let me go back to this picture. Kind of a metallic, reminds me of a kid's bicycle. And, um, and they are wood borers, but they normally feed on trees that are 
dead or, or dying. And in that way, they're actually an important part of a healthy uh, ecosystem um, because they help speed up the decomposition um, of dead and dying trees. But that's not the case with emerald ash borer. Um, it's not a health, part of a healthy forest ecosystem because it's, uh, it's exotic and invasive. Um, so going through its life cycle, these are the eggs and the eggs are laid um, in mid-June to mid-July. This is probably not what you would ever find. This is not what you should really be looking for because they're so cryptic and so small. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you what, what the eggs look like. Very tiny. Um, when the eggs hatch, the larvae bore under the bark and they feed on the cambium layer of the tree. So um, that the living green tissue that's just under the bark, they don't actually feed on the wood itself. And um, they, when they feed, they leave these trails that, that we uh, sometimes refer to as galleries. And the galleries of the um, emerald ash borer are S-shaped. So they go kind of back and forth in a meandering S-shaped pattern. Um, and that can kind of give you a clue as to what, you know, if you look at the shape of a gallery, you can, you know, see some peeling bark and look at the gallery. Um, you know, some beetles will have one main branch with branches coming off of it. That's not what the emerald ash borer does. It makes these meandering galleries. Here's another picture of galleries under the bark. Um, after they're done feeding um, and they're at their full, you know, um, full grown larval stage, then they pupate. They dig this little pupil chamber in the wood and they pupate and that's the stage that they go through the winter. And in the spring, they emerge from the bark and they um, emerge from a, a D-shaped exit hole. So that's definitely something that you you can look for, even if you don't see any insects, um, you might see the D-shaped exit holes. Um, and it's, uh, if you see a D-shaped exit hole in an ash tree, um, I, if I saw that, I would, I would think, uh, it's almost like you need to call 911 because it's a definite um, a serious sign. Please call somebody, don't just keep it to yourself. Call your master gardener uh, coordinator, call me, call your state. Department of Agriculture, but definitely let somebody know. And if you're able to take a picture, that would be ideal. Oh, I think I need to go to part two. So here's another picture of the D-shaped exit hole. It's not very big. It's about, I don't know, um, maybe half a mill half a centimeter. Um, it's it's kind of small. Here's some more uh, D-shaped exit holes in an ash tree. Another sign and symptom of EAB is defoliation and flagging in true ash. And um, Emerald ash borer feeds only on true ash, which are um, trees in the genus Fraxinus. Um, so if you see a Fraxinus, an ash tree with, with this kind of defoliation and flagging is when one branch is sticking out, one branch is defoliated and the rest of the tree still has its leaves. Um, that's, a, that's a definite sign uh, or symptom of emerald ash borer. More pictures of defoliation and flagging and true ash. Another sign um, is uh, these strange, strange growth patterns in a tree. Trees don't usually grow, you know, uh, leaves coming off the bottom trunk like this. Um, trunk sprouts are are a sign, and then when the you know when the rest of the tree is defoliated, that's a that's a high risk sign. Um, here's some more pictures of trunk sprouts. Um, and this happens because the insect has made galleries right here that has caused, um, spurred the, the tree to, to put out these um, sprouts right where uh, a gallery has kind of cut into the cambium layer of the tree. And when there are larvae under the bark, the woodpeckers are going to be feeding on those larvae. So you'll see excessive woodpecker damage in a tree that's infested 
with um, any insect larvae, but um, if it's in an ash tree, it's definitely a sign that it might be emerald ash borer. And when you have um, defoliation or, or tree death happening on a large scale like this, this is definitely something that you should uh, report if you, if you see something like this. Um, you know, every once in a while, one tree will die here and there, but when it's uh, on a large scale like this, it's, um, it's you know, something that should be looked into. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have one native ash tree, the Thraxinus latifolia, the Oregon ash. Um, but there are also a lot of non-native ash that have been planted as street trees or as, um, landscaping. Um, but the, the native Oregon ash, um, whenever I see it, it kind of looks yellow to me. It kind of stands out because it's a little bit more yellow than the rest of the trees that are around it. Um, so that's one way that I, you know, when I'm looking for them, I, I can kind of spot them. Um, and again, it, it is a compound leaf. So this right here is one leaf and these are leaflets coming off of the midrib of the leaf. Uh, here's another picture of, a, of an ash leaf. And the branches and leaves are opposite one another. So um, whether branches and leaves are opposite or alternate can tell you uh, can be a diagnostic feature to tell you um, that that's what that, that's what you're looking at. The native range of the of the emerald ash borer is Asia, um, China, Russia, uh, Korea, and Japan. And this map, it might be kind of hard to see, but as of the last surveys that were done, um, the yellow counties um, are where it was found. Um, and the, it says here that red counties were um, this year's finds, but there are no counties um, marked red yet, but it's still kind of early for this year. Um, but the red ones are where, you know, there are infestations of emerald ash borer. One of the things that makes emerald ash borer so difficult to manage is that there's really not a good detection trap. This is the detection trap that, um, that we need to use. Um, and as you might guess, it's, um, it's expensive and it's, it's difficult to work with. So you don't, you're not able to get very many traps out in one day. Um, this entire thing is covered in sticky. So it's uh, really uh, kind of difficult to work with and kind of difficult to transport in a vehicle. So for citizen science surveys, um, just some suggestions of how you can how you can help, and there are different levels of ways that you can help. Just by becoming aware, just um, increasing your awareness, um, you're more likely to when you know if you come across it, you'll you'll recognize it, and you'll remember that you you know that you learned about this, and and you'll be able to report it. But you can also um, intentionally go out with the intent of doing a survey. Um, so um, just some suggestions of what you can do. Familiarize yourself with true ash. You know, take a look at the pictures and, and learn how, I, how to identify it. And if you're able to find um, true ash trees near where you live or where you hike or where you work, find and record the locations of some true ash and visit them, um, you know, every once in a while, every few weeks. Um, read the materials, uh, familiarize yourself with the pictures. Inspect the ash trees carefully, including the entire trunk from, from the ground up to the top. And if you have binoculars, but that would be ideal. So you can look at the top of the tree, um, the large branches. Um, look at the base of the trunk for sawdust, sap, and frass. Um, if you are able to capture an insect that you think might be EAB, uh, place them in the freezer immediately um, so that you don't risk transporting them to any place. Um, and if you can take a picture, send them to me or send them to um, your master gardener coordinator or your uh, state department of agriculture. Record the location of your, of your host trees. Look for D-shaped exit holes. Unusual growth patterns like those um, strange, you know, trunk sprouts, excessive woodpecker damage, um, and take pictures with your phone if you see any of these signs or symptoms. Um, 
record your observations and include the letter from lunch if you can <clears throat> and the dates that you made your observation. If you're able to take pictures, that's ideal. If you see exit holes, definitely take pictures, take um, you know, good close-up pictures of the exit holes um, and label your photos with the date and the location where you took them. And if you want any help organizing um, your data collection system, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm really happy to help with that. <clears throat> and this is a picture of one of my coworkers um, at a major league baseball game. And um, just wanted to show you this to point out that um, baseball bats are a lot of baseball bats are made of ash. So the major league baseball um, organization um, got involved in outreach for, you know, to, to increase awareness of Emerald Ash Borer and, um, and USDA had this, had this outfit and one of my coworkers went, went to do some outreach there at a, at a baseball game. So then moving on to the um, Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is the female on the left, it's a lot bigger and the male on the right. This insect is in, again, the order Coleoptera, which are the beetles, and within that order, the family Cerambicidae, which are the longhorn beetles. And the insects in this family um, tend to have antennae that are um, at least as long as the rest of their body. Um, and going through its life cycle, uh, starting with the eggs, um, the female um, chews this shallow divot on the surface of the bark and deposit um, her eggs in that, in that overposition divot. And then when the larva hatches, um, the, the small um, early stages of the larva, the larvae feed on the cambium layer, but then as they get bigger, they burrow into the wood itself and they consume the wood. And then they make a pupation chamber and they pupate here uh, are the life stages shown side by side, the egg, the early larva, the large larva, the pupa right here, and then the adult. Here's some uh, Asian longhorn beetle galleries and some branches. And the pupa. Um, after the adult emerges from the pupa, it exits the, the tree through, a, um, through an exit hole that's perfectly round. In fact, it almost kind of, you know, the exit hole can look like it was made by a drill because it's so perfectly round. And this is something that you can look for. Even if you don't find an actual beetle, you might find signs of the exit holes or the overposition divots. And that's definitely something you can um, take a picture of and, and report because those are important signs of a population. Um, and that's a picture of the, of the adult Asian longhorn beetle. Um, here's a picture of the overposition divot and then the exit hole. You can kind of see how it's perfectly round. More exit holes. That one to me really looks like it was made by a drill. Um, sometimes you might see um, signs of adult feeding damage, just the adults don't really do a lot of feeding. It's really the larvae that do um, a lot of damage to the tree, but the adults can feed on the petioles. So that's just another clue that if you find it in, you know, um, along with other signs um, can be something to pay attention to. The adults can also feed on um, twigs. Another sign or symptom that you might see is um, grass, sawdust, and sap oozing out of the trunk and branches. The native range of the Asian longhorn beetle is China and Korea, and it has been introduced into many countries, um, England, Austria, France, Poland, and Germany. Um, this is kind of the latest um, map that I could find for, um, for the US. Uh, populations, Massachusetts and New York, as of May 2021. Um, the pink are the active federal quarantines, and the green are 
quarantines that have been rescinded. So these are populations that have been eradicated. And this is um, Ohio where another population was found, it's a fairly large population as of May, 2021. Um, this is the active quarantine right here in the pink patch. And in South Carolina, um, these are these dots are um, infested trees as of 2021. So I'm going to show you some pictures of insects that kind of look like um, Asian longhorn beetle, but I just want to stress that if you find any insect that um, that you're just not sure, uh, it doesn't hurt to take a picture um, if you're able to catch it, put it in the freezer, take a picture of it, um, and uh, and send them to me. I don't mind getting pictures. I get them all the time and I really don't mind looking at them because um, you know it can it can be easy to mistake them for other things that look very similar. This is the monocamus beetle, which is native to the Pacific Northwest, and it's a it's a part of a you know important part of a healthy forest ecosystem. It helps break down dead and dying trees. But it looks a lot like Asian longhorn beetle because it's black and it has white, white spots. Some of them have different colors, but some of them can be this color. Um, one of the main differences between this, the monocamus and the Asian longhorn beetle is that it's it's not shiny. It has kind of a, a matte matte finish instead of a shiny finish, um, and it has this white triangle at the base of its wings. And if you look at them side by side, you can see how the differences between them. The monocamus, the native beetle, is kind of dull black and this is very, very shiny black. And um, this white triangle here at the base. But like I said, I, I wouldn't expect people really to be able to tell the difference. Um, if you find this and you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to just take a picture of it or if you, you can catch one, put it in the freezer. Um, and I'm happy to look at those pictures if you want to send them to me. Here's another lookalike. Um, this is the Rosalia beetle, the banded alder borer. Um, this can com commonly be found on firewood piles. I find it in my firewood. Yolanda, um, oh, okay. It, the, the, slide wasn't, uh, the slide wasn't advancing, but it, it did. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, yes, this is the banded alder borer. Um, and um, in contrast to the Asian longhorn beetle, it doesn't have spots. It has bands, black and white bands. Um, but again, if you find one of these and you're just not sure, um, take a picture and, and send it send it to us. Um, these are the host trees of the Asian longhorn beetle. And many of these trees are very important to Washington, either, um, either important to the environment, to the you know, um, um, forest health, or their actual agricultural crops that are very important, like apple, pear, cherry. Um, so this insect would have a big impact if it were to come to Washington. So I want to talk about um, pathways a little bit. Pathways um, are the, the word that we use to describe how an insect gets to where it is, to um, from, from where it was to, to where it could be. Um, so how, how does it get here? How, would, how could it get here? Um, ALB, Asian longhorn beetle, and EAB, emerald ash borer, have some similar pathways because they are both wood boring beetles that can, um, that can travel on, on wood. So solid wood packing material like wood pallets um, or dunnage um, or, or crates that are used to ship products from Asia. Uh, these insects can, can, can be moved on solid wood packing material. Also firewood. Um, nursery stock and yard waste. So well, here's some um, examples of woodpacking material. Um, of course, Customs and Border Protection inspects woodpacking material, but only a small percentage, um, very small percentage of, of the, you know, the quantities that are coming in actually get inspected. So it would be easy for, for something to be missed. Um, here's an example of a cerambicid larva, um, a, a longhorn beetle larva. It's not, it's not Asian longhorn beetle, but it's a, a related beetle on a wood pallet. 
And this is just, you know, an example of how they could, you know, how they could get here from China or from other locations where, um, where a, you know, an exotic insect could come. Um, I just wanted to show this picture, just kind of emphasize the quantity of wood pellets that are coming to the US um, every day. These um, shipping containers are full of wood pellets. Wood pellets are how cargo can get loaded onto a shipping container. So they all have wood pellets in them. Um, when countries began to realize that a lot of um, exotic invasive insects were moving around on wood pellets and other woodpecking material, um, a lot of regulations um, came into effect. Um, and so now all solid woodpecking material must be treated with, with heat or with methyl bromide fumigation um, sufficient to destroy any wood boring insects. And treated wood is stamped with an IPPC stamp. IPPC stamp, and this is what a, a stamp might typically look like. Um, but um, not all stamped wood is, uh, is free of beetles because stamps can be counterfeited and fumigations can be done improperly. So um, this doesn't guarantee that we're not going to get, you know, uh, insect larvae in wood pellets or woodpecking material. Another pathway, <clears throat> how these uh, insects can move around is on firewood. And um, when this became um, really evident, the, the, um, the Nature Conservancy in, in co collaboration with State Departments of Agriculture and the USDA uh, created the do not move firewood.org website. And I encourage you to take a look at it. There's a lot of good information. Um, it has a lot of good um, material for, for kids, um, coloring pages, and um, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. To, to, look at it and read it and um, get some information. And um, the other pathway um, is nursery stock. Um, this, is, um, this is a bonsai maple that was actually um, brought, brought a wood boring insect that's closely related to the Asian longhorn beetle. It wasn't Asian longhorn beetle, but it was in the same genus um, and it actually, um, brought the beetle to Washington several years ago this happened and and it was it was found fortunately and they were able to eradicate it but nursery stock is one way that they can move around and come to new places one of the things that um, again Asian longhorn beetle makes it challenging is that there's not a good track and war um, so that we can detect um, you know small low level infestations so this is one way that uh, that they do survey for Asian longhorn beetle, they actually have to climb up into the canopy and look for exit. The exit holes are the thing that they're looking for here, that perfectly round exit hole. So survey methods for citizen science. Um, and, you know, citizen science surveys are, are so important because um, the Department of Agriculture, the State Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture don't really have the resources to, um, to get out there and, and look, um, you know, look as much as we should to detect these populations before they are able to grow and spread and get established. So um, these, you know, these citizen science surveys are really important and, and, and helpful. Um, and again, there's two ways that you can get involved. You can just kind of passively get involved by becoming aware, um, educating yourself, look at the pictures so that you're familiar with them. So when you do see it, you'll recognize it and you'll be able to report it. But you can also go out with the intent of, of um, doing a survey. And if you want to do that, that, that would be great. Um, so locate 10 host trees of ALB on your property or um, places where you go, um, places where you hike, play, you know, where you work. Um, spend a minute or two carefully examining the tree, the entire trunk and the large branches. Look at the base of the trunk for sawdust and grass. Um, if you're able to use binoculars, that would be ideal. Um, if you are able to capture an insect that you think might be AL ALB, uh, put it uh, in a jar and immediately into the freezer. And then you can, you know, later when they're frozen, take a picture and send it to us. Um, 
and record the condition of the host trees. Look for exit holes that are perfectly round and slightly smaller than a dime. Um, remember those overposition divots that I showed a picture of at the beginning? Um, sawdust and frass along on the, on the ground at the base of the tree and unusual growth uh, and symptoms of tree decline. If you're able to take pictures with your phone of any of these signs or symptoms, that, that would be great. <clears throat> Um, and again, record your observations with the latitude and longitude if possible. Take photos of any of the feeding damage, the exit holes. Um, if you're able, if you find um, the perfectly round exit holes that look like they were made by a drill, slightly smaller than dime, um, please uh, call us. Call somebody. Uh, report it immediately. Don't just um, don't just sit on that because uh, that could be the early infestation that. You know, the earlier that they're found, the better the outcome. Label your photos with the dates and locations where you took them. And if you want some, some suggestions and help how to format and organize um, your survey data, if you really want to do a survey, um, that would be great. Don't, uh, don't hesitate to contact me, I can help you with that. Another way that you can help is to discuss exotic invasive tree pests with your family, friends, and acquaintances, um, and be an advocate for protecting our plants and environment from exotic pests. Because a lot of times, um, the more cooperation that we have from the public, and the more um, the more the public is, um, in, you know, supporting what what uh, what we do, um, the better the outcome. And definitely, as I said before, visit the Do Not Move the don'tmovefirewood.org website. Um, and if you find any signs or symptoms, um, even if you're not sure that they really are signs or symptoms, it doesn't hurt to take a picture and send it to us. I really don't mind getting pictures, even if they're nothing. Um, I would rather that, you know, somebody didn't just uh, ignore something that might be a serious um, infestation. Um, remain observant in the landscapes you spend time in and pay attention to the conditions of plants or trees and make a note of any changes that you see from one season to the next. And again, here's my contact information. Um, if you want to report anything, if you want to send pictures, if you want help on formatting some data collection, um, feel free to contact me. Yolanda, there's a question that's asking, are all pallets shipped to the US supposed to be treated or just from some countries? Um, just from foreign countries. From any um, any other country, it's not just yes. certain countries. Okay. Yes, any, any other country, and it's actually um, it's a treaty that countries um, sign sign on to. So um, all the countries that trade with each other, they have agreed to sign this treaty, and they have agreed to behave in this way. To, you know, to either treat their pallets with either methyl bromide or heat treatment, and then stamp them to show that they've been treated. And it's just an agreement that the countries have entered into. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I, did I go too short or too long? Oh, no, or? you're fine. Um, I think um, Carol is gonna be pulling our presentation back up. We're gonna kind of go over some final thoughts. And if other folks want to um, start thinking about other questions you'd like to pose to Yolanda, um, get ready to put those in the chat box. So Yolanda, if you could stop sharing and Carol will start sharing. Okay. Okay. Thanks Yolanda, that was incredible. And terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. All right. So, um, for your observation outings, we just recommend that you um, make as many observation outings as you wish. Be sure and take pictures with your smartphone. Be mindful of traffic and watch for uneven ground. We want you to be safe. Um, as Yolanda suggested, maybe take binoculars with you. That could be helpful if you're looking up into the um, crown of the tree. Um, but please don't enter private property. Don't climb, use ladders, or reach an unsafe distance. 
and don't perform any eradication or removal. This, of course, applies more to um, weeds. Sounds like if you find an insect, Yolanda is careful, you know, comfortable with your catching it and freezing it. So that's the approach they want you to take. Um, don't touch any plants you think could be poisonous. Just use a stick to manipulate if necessary for pictures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to report a finding for insects, what I'm hearing is please let Yolanda know because it would be pretty um, exciting. And she's talking about these insects that we are trying to be very proactive on. But also we recommend that you use EdMaps phone app EDMAP stands for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. It's a web-based system for documenting invasive species and pest distribution, and it covers the entire US and Canada. We will demonstrate the phone app uh, later on at the end of this presentation. So those of you who are comfortable with the app can leave early if you'd like. And another reporting app is maintained by the Washington Invasive Species Council, WISC, and they also share their data with EDMAPS. Uh, Carol, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you at this point. Thanks, Kim. Um, we just want to remind everyone that this presentation and other helpful links can be found on the WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardener website. The link to the website is going to be included in the chat box if you don't already have it. Um, we will have the presentation and um, and we'll also we can also actually um, upload Yolanda's presentation there as well. The Master Gardener website has links to these helpful fact sheets on the three invasive weeds um, that we learned about from Justin's presentation last night. And these insect fact sheets um, are also really helpful. They're from um, USDA and they provide information on the three insects that we've talked about tonight. And I'll turn it over to you, Erica. All right, so first off, I wanna just say thank you very much to Yolanda for taking the time to um, educate us and get us going on this. I know we have a lot of pretty eager folks in our group that are gonna definitely be keeping an eye out. I wanna thank Kim and Carol, you've been a lot of fun to work with on this project. And I wanna thank all of the attendees who have taken an interest in protecting our community. Uh, if you were not with us uh, for last night's presentation on invasive weeds, I hope you have plans to view the recording of it. I have put a link in the chat box that goes to our website where it can be found. And if you click on it now, it will open in another window that will still be there after we close out this evening and all of the supporting materials and links that we have are there as well. So before we open it up to questions, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to complete a very short evaluation of this presentation. I'm gonna launch it on the screen here in a moment. And as Kim mentioned at the beginning, it includes six items, which are essentially in pairs, for which we'd like you to indicate your knowledge. The first in each pair asks you to rate your knowledge before the talk, and the second on your knowledge following the talk. They look like duplicates, but they're not. Um, and then lastly, we want to know if you intend to go out and scout for the insects discussed tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll now. And you should see it on your screen. And it'll take just a minute or two for folks to go ahead and click through the seven questions. So you could just use your mouse to click on the question, uh, the answer that you'd like to select.
Okay, we've got 83% of you, just four people left. And I think that might, might be the four presenters. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And share the results, there they are. Download those for safekeeping. And if you'd like to put questions in the chat box, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, forward those to Yolanda. So there's a question that's asking, is there um, any simple chart that shows most host plants and most basic signs? Yolanda, are you aware of anything like that? Um, I think there probably is. I could look for something. Um, I know that our website, um, the websites that I use have, have test data sheets. That there might be something. So I could, if you'd like me to send something to you, a link, or how would you like me to get that to you? But I'll look you, for something tomorrow. You can send it to, them, to me and then I can put it on our website with the other materials. Okay, so we're looking for something that shows. Um, can you the, re the, the request here was a, like a simple chart that shows host plants and some of the basic signs so that somebody could just kind of get, get an overall view of those items. Okay. Okay. Um, somebody's asking, uh, is anyone else having trouble with the EdMaps app? They said they tried to upload it after yesterday's presentation, but it crashes over and over. Um, I haven't heard anybody um, mention this. Um, if others are, you can put it in the chat box. I know that uh, it looks like most of the people here were on last night's call. So, um, Kim, I wonder if you could do any troubleshooting on why you think that might be occurring? Um, sure, I would be happy to. Okay. Uh, so yeah, why don't you go ahead and if, if any questions come in, um, uh, we can forward those to Yolanda after you're done. So would you like me to troubleshoot right here? If uh, Well, no, I thought maybe, if, uh, were you going to pull up the, um, just kind of pull up the app again? and, and Yes, give us I am. Little, yeah. It's, it's now a good point for that. There's no other questions except um, another request for a handout. Okay. Um, and so we'll see what Yolanda sends us. Okay, so I'm going to um, share my screen. Someone else is saying, I didn't have any problem and I sent in a Tansy Ragwort sighting. All right, Pam, you get points <laughs> for, for being quick. So are you seeing my screen? Not yet. Okay, so somehow, I am not seeing the, the screen where I can select to um, share my screen. All I can see is Erica's picture. What am I doing wrong here? So if you click on the bottom where the blue box is with the white camera, that's the Zoom icon. Right, right. Can it's you see not, that? Yeah, it's just not happening. <clears throat> Try something different here. So um, Aaron is saying, okay, it's probably just me. I can try installing it. You don't have to hold everyone up for my issue. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just, just make sure you, you choose the, um, the EdMaps, the one that, there's a lot of versions of EdMaps. There's EdMaps, Webst, and some other things. But choose the one that has like the uh, magnifying glass symbol. That's the most straightforward one. It, it doesn't have a lot of extra functionality that we don't need. Also, we heard that someone was having some concerns about um, permissions that the app's requiring. If you have a very strong antivirus filter, it might not allow you to upload this app. Um, so you might have to check into that. If you have concerns about the app and, um, and security, once you've installed it, you can always go in and remove all the permissions. You can still use the app, but then when you go to report, it will ask you to um, give it permission to do certain things. But the app does need um, some permissions to be able to you know, use your phone and to upload. It needs it for its functionality as far as reporting goes. 
hope that's helpful. Okay, well, there's no other questions. So um, if, uh, did Kim or Carol have anything else to close out or um, any parting words? Oh. Go ahead, Kim. No, I'm, I think uh, that's all I have unless people would like me to walk through the um, app demo. Maybe folks could put in the chat box if you'd like to see a, a, a run through of the app. Not having any come through. Uh, okay. One person said yes and one said no, thank you. So at this point, I think it would be a good time to go ahead and tell the folks that um, are feeling comfortable with EdMaps that if you wanna go ahead and bow out and go see if you can get a sighting in before it gets too dark, um, that would be great. And then other folks, if you wanna see it again, stick around or if you weren't around last night, we'll do a, a take a look now. Okay, and this is assuming here that I can get my Is it maybe Londa is, she, is is someone still um is does someone still have the screen or the No, there's there's up? no um no one else sharing right now. My Kim, I noticed that mine was on a my mine was on a minimize video and I had to enlarge it again and then everything all my controls came back. I'm not exactly sure what that function was, but there was okay. a minimized it the screen was minimized and I had to click on it to get it to enlarge and then I had the controls again. Okay. Well guess what? I just ran across an option for some reason that said return to meeting. Okay. Yes. I do want to be at the meeting. <laughs> All right. Um, All learning experience. Yes. Share screen. Share. And I would like to share my phone. I believe you can probably see my phone at this point. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. So um, the first thing you'll need to do, of course, is install EdMaps. Um, it's in the apps in the Apple Store or the Play Store for Android phones. Be sure to select EdMaps. Um, it's the one with the magnifying glass simple, symbol. And it has the um, simplest set of functionality for our, our purposes here. Then to create a report, you simply open the app. And just a thought, if you are opening it for the first time on your phone, you will be prompted to select a state, select Washington. This ensures you have the Washington listed species fact sheets readily available to you in the field. And you can create your user login at this point or wait until you need to upload a report. For a new sighting, go to the report observation menu, select or tap new sighting, select a subject. In this case, I'm going to use the magnifying glass and type in EM and it gives me all the species on the Washington list that have EM in their name. And it happens to be only one, that's emerald ash borer. That's now the subject. Images, click on images. You can take a picture or you can choose a picture from your gallery that you've already taken. I'm gonna pick up one from my gallery. You can easily add pictures. And remember with insects, it's not just the insect, but of the damage that they um, are causing. Automatically populated is the date of the report that you're making, the location. Um, what's a little different about insects is that the questions are slightly different. Um, infestation, for example, you would tap to to say, you know, if you saw the insect, what stage of life was it in? Adult, eggs, larva. Um, if you just found evidence of damage, like for the emerald ash borer, you would say 
hey, this is where I found it. This is the tree I found it in. Um, habitat, the habitat selection is the same as for weeds. A lot of options, so please use that. And then put in any additional details or notes that you might have and save your observation or save your report or citing, whatever terminology you're, you're comfortable with. Then you've got the report, but EdMaps doesn't have it yet. They won't have it until you upload it. To upload, you go to your upload queue. Up comes a list of all your sightings. At this point, if you were to click on the up arrow here, this would upload all of these sightings to EdMaps. However, if you want to edit a report or look at it again, you can click on it, make your changes, save it, then, then, um, then you could upload it. Or if you want to be a little more selective, go to the box, literally this box here, and you can check items or reports that you wish to upload, use the upload button. Or if you've made a report or you're practicing or whatever, um, you can check the box and just go ahead and discard the report. Okay, let me get rid of it. Um, but do remember if you're logged in and you select the upload arrow, the app will immediately perform an upload. However, if you're not logged in, the app will promise, prompt you to log in or to register and log in. So I am going to take you through a walkthrough of the registration screen, which is very straightforward. Going to the navigation menu, EdMaps login, register. They want your first name, your last name, your email, a password, reporter category, you will probably select either volunteer or citizen scientist, whichever you're comfortable with, country. And then there's a question about public profile. There are a lot of researchers that um, use the database that's maintained by EdMaps. And if they have a question about a sighting and your information is public, you might be contacted or other people just using the database could see who made a report. If you're not comfortable with that, turn the public profile off. Even if the public profile is off though, EdMaps may contact you if they have questions because they just don't automatically upload all reports. They do, they do do a review of reports and they may have questions because they wanna make sure that there's good data going into the database. And then you hit register, and that's all there is to it. I do have a few tips. Um, if you're out in the field, especially, use the species information list. It's very handy if you're out there. And let's say you, oops, let's say you um, think you might have seen an emerald ash borer. E M, emerald ash borer. You're not sharing right now, Kim. Oh, it slipped off, huh? Okay. Yeah. So back up real quickly. Um, you go to the species list. And let's say you think you may have seen emerald ash borer. You select it. And then you can see more info on it, key features. You can see images and scroll through them. This is nice. It even shows you that um, exit hole, which is so distinctive. And the damage that it does to the tree. And remember that if you're out of cell phone range, say you're out hiking, you can still create a report if you have the app installed and then go back later and upload it. 
And if you have any further questions on the how-to aspects of reporting, um, we're asking you to please first visit the EdMaps um, website and go to the Tools and Training tab. And this will allow you to get a printout of instructions or to download some more specific instructions on using the uh, phone app. So that completes this refresher course on using the phone app. If no one has any questions, I will turn this over to you, Carol. I don't have anything else to add. I just um, really appreciated the presentation.